Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast at the Robert Menzies Institute, hosted by Georgina Downer. Sectarianism might seem an anachronism to the current generation in Australia, but it wasn't that long ago that Australian society was firmly divided between Protestants and Catholics. Even Robert Menzies felt the impact of his own family's sectarianism when, as a Victorian state MP in 1928, he attended the opening of a local Catholic school with Catholic Archbishop Daniel Mannix, only to be bitterly scolded by his parents for sharing the stage with the Catholic leader. Menzies himself was against sectarianism, seeing it as contrary to Christian virtues of neighbourly love and also religious freedom. But joining me today to discuss the history of sectarianism in Australia is historian and author Dr. Jeff Kilday. Welcome to Afternoon Light, Jeff. Well, thank you for having me to talk about this very interesting subject. Oh, it is. It is a fantastic subject. And you've written quite a few books in between being a barrister for most of your career. You've written quite a few books on this issue and this particular period in Australian history, the sort of early 20th century, where it was as sharply felt the issue of sectarianism. But it's been a real passion of your life, hasn't it? A bit of a labour of love. Yes, it has. And in fact, it was the subject of my PhD thesis. And since then, I've just continued to expand my inquiry into the area. And yeah, it's taken me in various directions. And here I am about 24 years after that PhD, still working on it. Oh, it's fantastic. Well, that's because you're obviously genuinely interested and passionate about it. But Irish Australians or Australians of Irish Irish heritage, these days our migrant population is so diverse and probably wouldn't even know particularly if someone was Irish heritage these days. They're so a part of who we are as an Australian people and nation. But tell me about the Irish in Australia in the 19th and that early 20th century. Why were they so distinct that they deserved doing a PhD on them? (laughs) Well, I think the first thing we need to be clear about is that oftentimes when we talk about the Irish in this period, we're talking about Catholic Irish. We should remember that the Irish, both Catholic and Protestant, were part of the founding people of the colony from 1788 onwards. Through the 19th century, about 25% of immigrants came from Ireland, and of those, about 85% were Catholic. So there's still 15% of the Irish who came to Australia in the 19th century were Protestant, and we shouldn't ignore that distinction. But where the Catholic Irish became distinct is that there was the religious difference. Since the Reformation, Britain had become Protestant, the Irish had remained Catholic and to a large and overwhelming extent. And there was also sort of an ethnic difference as well, even between the Catholic Irish and the Protestant Irish, in the sense that many of the Protestant Irish who came to Australia were Anglo-Irish, who had British heritage. So the Catholic Irish, if we can just talk about them largely, and they stood out largely because of their religion but also because of what was perceived as ethnic differences. For instance, in the early part of the 19th century, a lot of the Irish convicts who came spoke Irish and not English. So there was even a language difference. Then looked at from the other side, there were often English stereotypes of the Irish as drunken, rebellious, lazy Cartoons of the 19th century often depicted the Irish as monkey-like people. Reverend Samuel Marsden, the flogging parson, regarded the Irish as, quote, the most wild, ignorant and savage race that were ever favoured with the light of salvation. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And these were prejudices coming from Britain, no doubt. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, you know, it's a universal concept amongst humans that we look down on others. You know, the Germans look down on the French or the French look down on the Germans. And so the British looked down on the Irish. And because the British were the dominant force in the population, a lot of these stereotypes just were perpetuated. And Jeff, this 25% of migrants to Australia in, in this period, were they coming as convicts or as free settlers, the Irish? What was the nature of their arrival to the colonies in Australia? (laughs) Well, they came as both. There were Irish in the First Fleet, and so large numbers of Irish did come as convicts, and a group of them did come as political prisoners 
following the rising in 1798 in Ireland. Many Irish convicts who had been imprisoned as a result of that uprising were sent to Australia and so there was a large number of Irish political prisoners who were transported. But as the century wore on and schemes for assisted immigration took hold, the colonies were seeking to attract immigrants to help build up the colonies. And so you have bounty schemes and assisted immigration schemes. And the Irish were disproportionately part of those assisted immigration schemes. And that's where you get the big explosion of the Irish coming to Australia under these assisted immigration programs. So these were free settlers, but assisted by government subsidies. And many, of course, came off their own bat and so forth. But that's how the Irish did come. And that reflected the poor conditions for them in Ireland. Presumably they saw Australia as this, well, being advertised as the working man's paradise and a place where you could have a better life. Yeah, you know, that's eat right. a lot of meat. I think they were saying, you, can, you know, if you come to the colonies in Australia, you can eat meat three times a day, <laughs> lamb chops for breakfast, lunch yeah. and dinner. <laughs> well, of course, you had before the famine, which was in 1846 to 51 approximately, you still had large numbers seeking to come to Australia because before the famine, Ireland had a population of about 8 million. It still doesn't have 8 million. That's how devastating the famine was. It basically halved the Irish population through the course of the 19th century, both with those who died as a result of the famine and those who emigrated as a result of the famine. Before the famine, numbers coming to seek a better life from a crowded Ireland, because if you're one of 10 children hoping to get a share of the farm which your parents have, which may be, say, five acres. <laughs> and to Australians, of course, that sounds bizarre. It's just a big uh, garden. Yeah, that's right. What do you do? So a lot of the Irish who came before the famine came seeking that better life. And of course, those who came after the famine had a greater reason to do so. But bear in mind, Australia didn't accept large numbers coming from the famine because those who were devastated by the famine mostly went to Britain or North America because it was cheaper and easier. To come to Australia took longer and therefore you had to have more resources to get here. But even so, the famine brought a lot of the Irish also. But we also had the gold discoveries. So a lot of Irish came and an Irishman like Peter Lawler, who led the Eureka Stockade Rebellion. So that fits the stereotype, I suppose, of the rebellious Irish. Yes. But, so the Irish came in large numbers for various reasons, but largely to make a better life. And of course, you had oodles of land out here. And you know, the five acres for the 10 kids turns into you know 5,000 acres for one or two people. So it's a big attraction. But the Irish here coming to Australia, they lived a bit differently, didn't they, from their brothers and sisters who went to, say, the United States, where there was more Irish ghettos and very kind of distinct communities that were separate from the rest of the, say, American society. In Australia, they did try and be part of the community a bit more, but still had elements of the way they lived, not least their yep. religion, that made them quite separate. And of course, that ends up breeding a bit of mistrust, doesn't it? Yeah, that's right. It's true that the Irish did not form ghettos in Australia, though they did settle in various parts of the cities, in Sydney and Melbourne. Even today, there are suburbs that you can identify as the suburbs that, that where the Irish did settle. And by and their street names and things like that, is it? That's right. And in the city suburbs that are so nice to wander around, they're often where the Irish settled. And say in New South Wales, there's a band that stretches to the southwest of Sydney where the Irish were in large proportions. But what you've got is a situation where, say, 25% is the average of the Irish coming as immigrants. There would be some areas where the population of Irish might get up to, say, 33 35%. But it never got to the stage where you'd have these just blocks of Irish in ghettos. Yes, there was a much greater opportunity for mixing with non-Irish. So the British and Protestants and Irish Catholics would coexist together. But they went to separate schools, didn't they? So you had Catholic schools from the early, early days, and then they tended to marry, Catholics would marry their own people of their own religion, not really outside of religion, and join their own community groups as well. Yes, that's right. 
you get a situation where education in New South Wales from early on was government run, government funded. Uh, then in 1836, you get Governor Richard Burke introducing the Church Act, which provided money to each of the major denominations equally. So you had the Church of England, which was the biggest, Catholics and Presbyterians, and then also Methodists were each, according to their numbers in the population, were given government funding for their churches and also for their schools. So what happens is later on, by the 1880s, the governments across the colonies are removing government funding for denominational schools and introducing free, compulsory and secular education run by the state. Now, the Catholics decided they weren't going to be part of that scheme. And so they continued with their schools, even though the funding was cut off from the state, the Catholic people built the schools from then on at their own expense. And also we have the nuns and teaching brothers who provide the Catholic children with education without payment. And if it weren't for those dedicated nuns and brothers, the system could not have worked, but it continued to operate because of free labour that they were providing. That breaks down or starts to break down as the Catholics can no longer afford it. And hence we get in the 1960s the move back towards state aid. For that 80 years, the Catholics were supplying their own schools. And this was seen by Protestants as sort of the Catholics being exclusive, cutting themselves off from the community, teaching their crazy religion and being disloyal. Catholics were perceived as disloyal because going back to the Reformation, the gunpowder plot when the Catholic Guy Fawkes tried to blow up Parliament and the, and the Protestant king, Castle Hill Rebellion, the Irish rebelled here. So there's this sense of both exclusiveness and exclusion. Catholics were exclusive and excluded. Yeah, and so that sense that the Catholics rejected mainstream Australian society or sort of colonial yeah. New South Wales, Victorian society, for example. That was the Protestant That was how the Protestant perceived. By sending children to yeah. these Catholic-run schools. Jeff, tell me about sectarianism, though, itself. It's as old as the colonies, isn't it, in yeah. terms of from the late 18th century. How does it develop? And I know, I mean, what we're really going to focus on is the early 20th century in our discussion today, but how is it developing? Is it linked to the schools or linked to these kind of tropes around the Irish Catholics being kind of lazy and up to no good, mischievous? Yeah, I think you've got both the perceptions of the British Protestants of the Irish Catholics as being inferior, cutting themselves off from the rest of the community. But you've also got to understand that sectarianism was a two-way street. It's not only sort of Protestants beating up on the Catholics. The Catholics had their own reaction to it. It's sort of asymmetrical. And it's often the case when a majority looks down on a minority, the way the majority treats the minority causes a reaction by the minority against the majority, but they are sort of different. So what you get up is quite a degree of violence in some ways. Now, the ultra-Protestants celebrated the 12th of July, which is the anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne, in which the Protestant King William of Orange defeated the Catholic King James II at the Battle of the Boyne in Ireland. And each year on the 12th of July, the Orangemen would come out and celebrate that. Well, oftentimes the Catholics would schedule a hurling match on the 12th of July at a park near to where the Orangemen were going to be celebrating. And of course, you've got these Irishmen with their hurley sticks <laughs> would often then try to break up the meeting of the Orangemen. And so there was often this violence. And in 1846 in Melbourne, shots were fired. And there's a whole series during the 19th century of these sort of events where Irish Catholics beat up on the Protestants. So it's a two-way street. As I say, it's asymmetrical. The way people reacted to each other just depended on their relative power positions. It was endemic in Australia during the 19th century and early 20th century. Mostly it simmered just below the surface and every now and again boiled over with those events such as the 12th of July or St. Patrick's Day or whatever. But again, we can't over-exaggerate it because there were many situations, particularly in country towns, where Protestants and Catholics helped each other. They would help build each other's churches. A Catholic woman who could play the organ might attend the Protestant service in order to play the organ there because the Protestants didn't have an organist. So 
We just got to be a bit careful about not getting into the trap of seeing it all as violent and antagonistic. There was a lot of cooperation. But just as the Balkans, where people had lived together side by side for hundreds of years, sort of blew up in the 1990s and people who were neighbours started killing each other, so too, when you get a cause or some event happens, people who do otherwise cooperate with each other can start to become very antagonistic. And we see that when the Irish, for instance, press for home rule, for self-government for Ireland, that becomes a source of antagonism between Catholics and Protestants. And education, where Catholics start demanding the resumption of funding for education, that becomes a source of antagonism. And then, of course, you've got the sectarian warriors, the guys up at the top who are calling each other bad names and People are then forced into a position, which side do I choose? And it becomes quite tribal. Jeff, it's something, I think, to reflect on that while Australia and the colonies of Australia were thought of as racially homogenous or white, we had the White Australia policies, one of the first pieces of legislation passed by the new Commonwealth of Australia in 1901. But the reality is that, that while it might have been white, it was religiously quite a pluralistic society. With You have the Irish Catholics, you have Protestants, Presbyterians and Methodists and people from across the British Isles and from Ireland where they actually were bringing quite different strands of Christianity and different traditions and actually had sort of ancient enmities built into right. some of their relationships too. That did mean that for the colonies of Australia to work, there had to be a level of religious tolerance and an acceptance of difference that might otherwise not have been the case if you'd stayed back in the UK. That's right. And that's what I say. At a general level, there was a lot of cooperation, but particular events caused outbreaks of the antagonism between the two groups. Jeff, tell me about Irish Australian supporters of home rule, particularly in that 19th century period, why does it become something that they really care about when actually they're living in the colony of New South Wales in Victoria? It doesn't really personally affect them and it's not like they're toing and froing between the two countries. I mean, let's be honest, you weren't jumping on that ship back to Ireland anytime soon unless you had huge means. (laughs) Yeah, I think that your premise is not quite accurate. (laughs) And it comes out during the debates over home rule because home rule was seen as a serious constitutional change to the British Empire. And particularly those opposed to home rule for Ireland saw it as the thin end of the wedge in the breakup of the British Empire. And that's why many in Britain were opposed to home rule because they feared that home rule was just the first step on the way to Irish independence and that it would see the breakup of the British Empire. So it was sort of seen like Brexit. So if you let Britain yeah. leave the EU, that will then be the catalyst for other states leaving the EU in its entirety will just break up. So there was sort of this slippery it, it, slope. It, it, it's, yeah. That's right. It's the start of the breakup. And so many British Protestants saw it as a, essential to put the lid on this. The Irish in Australia and the Irish in Ireland we were saying, well, hang on, this is just domestic home rule, something similar to what, say, Scotland has now. And we don't want to break up the British Empire. We just want to be able to have a parliament that will deal with our domestic issues. We're happy for the empire to continue with foreign affairs and defence and major issues, but we just want to govern ourselves. But many of those opposed to home rule weren't convinced by that because they thought, well, you might say that, but you're not going to be satisfied with just domestic home rule. You're going to want to take the next step. But be that as it may, the Irish in Australia basically were arguing, look, we have in Australia, and you might remember that from the 1850s, the Australian colonies had self-government, they had responsible government. So the Irish in Australia were saying, well, look, Why can't the Irish in Ireland have the same as we have here in Australia, self-government? And we in Australia, we're still part of the British Empire. There's a bit of a difference because of 12,000 miles separates uh, England from Australia. So, you know, the internet wasn't so good back then either. It's hard to get a message across quickly. (laughs) But I think that's generally the approach, though, that the Irish in Australia who were supporters of home rule saw that 
this is a good thing. It will help the empire in a way because it will take away the grievance that many of the Irish feel about the British and it can only do good for the empire. So it did concern all Australians as to whether or not this was the start of the breakup of the British Empire. And of course, one side was saying it was and the other side was saying it wasn't. But what led then, Jeff, in 1905 to both houses of the Australian Parliament passing resolutions in favour of Home Rule, which is, I think, quite a significant decision of a you know Parliament in Australia passing legislative well, motion relating <laughs> to a country 12,000 miles away? I mean, this is <laughs> we're a colony. Yeah, but again, if you see it in the context of Australia being a part of the British Empire. They saw it as part of their interests. Yeah, that part of their interests, and we have a right to say something about this, to encourage the British Parliament to pass a Home Rule Bill. Canada had passed resolutions, I think, in the 1880s. They passed a few resolutions. By the time the Australians got around to it in 1905, it wasn't that controversial, except it became a controversy here in Australia, and people lined up on our side of the issue. But that sort of just reinforces the fact Now, what we're dealing with is constitutional change to the British Empire. So, yes, we do have a say in it and we should be heard at moment. Jeff, tell me about the lead up to the Great War, to World War I. We have some massive debates, of course, during that time over conscription and there is quite an attack on the Irish-Australian population, isn't there? Concerns about their loyalty to the Crown, to enlisting and being part of the war effort, aren't there? Yes. Put it in context, as I've mentioned, you've got the Irish struggle for self-government, you've got the education issue, and you've got the question of Catholic loyalty dating back hundreds of years. Now, that comes to a head in the years before the First World War. In 1912, the Asquith government introduces the Third Home Rule Bill. In 1912, the Catholic Church establishes the Catholic Federation largely to seek the reinstatement of funding to Catholic schools. Those two issues come together so that even at meetings that are debating whether or not home rule is a good thing or a bad thing, well, for those who are arguing it's bad, they'll often also say no to state aid for Catholic schools. So the two issues became entwined in the years before the outbreak of the First World War, the last few years. But then what happens is that in August 1914, of course, war breaks out and a truce settles into the community, whereas the last few years there'd been a lot of this antagonism over those issues because both the Catholics and the Protestants come together to join in the war effort. And you've got Catholic bishops encouraging Catholics to enlist. Even Mannix sees the war as a just war at this stage. Archbishop Mannix, as you may know, of course, becomes quite a a divisive figure in conscription debates and so forth. But in 1914, he, along with basically all of the other Catholic bishops, is saying we should support Britain in the war effort. So this truce comes into play, but the truce only lasts for about 18 months because you get the Easter Rising. But just coming back to this point of why would the Australian Irish support the war effort? Again, it's this question of the Irish in Australia were proud members of the British Empire. I mean, you're part of the biggest show in town, the biggest empire in the world. Why wouldn't you be proud of that? But the Irish in Australia didn't have the same emotional attachment to the British Empire as British Protestants did. Australian attachment was more pragmatic. It was accepted that Australia was this white enclave in this Asian sea, and the fear of the yellow peril and so forth. And the only thing that was protecting us from the yellow peril was the British Empire and the Royal Navy. So there's a very strong pragmatic reason for seeing that the British Empire had to survive this war. Already Germany had colonies in New Guinea and in the islands. So if Germany were to win the war, Australia would come under German subjugation. And the Irish in Australia did not want that at all. They were doing quite well in Australia under the British crown and did not want that to change. So that's why the Irish in Australia support the war effort. The problems occur when the Irish in Ireland rebel in April 1916 in the Easter Rising, and that throws in a whole new dynamic. And what happens there is that 
at first the Australian Irish are critical of the rebels in Ireland. Even again, Archbishop Mannix says he deplores the outbreak, says that the leaders were misguided. Then the British put the rebellion down and start executing the leaders, introduce martial law into Ireland, intern thousands of Irish men and women and ship them off to prison camps in Wales. So the Australian Irish react against that and start saying, you know, the British are mismanaging this, they're badly treating the Irish. And here we are, of course, in the middle of a war. British Protestants turn around and say, well, you guys, you Catholics, stabbing Britain in the back. We should be continuing to support Britain. So that's when the truth starts to fall apart between the Catholics and the Protestants. And and then in the middle of this, you have these conscription referendum in Australia on two Exactly. A few months after that, Billy Hughes says he's going to introduce conscription. So that then exacerbates the divide because the Irish mostly are opposed to conscription, not because they're against the empire or want to see the empire lose, although that was the rhetoric used against them, but because for many, Australia was sending volunteers. It was doing all it could at the moment. If we send all our workers out, the bosses will start bringing in foreign labour, Chinese labour, cheap labour. And so for the same reasons as the working class movement in Australia opposed conscription, so too did most of the Irish oppose conscription. It's amazing, Billy Hughes, the the Prime Minister who's introducing these conscription referendum, it's amazing he writes to the British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, and saying that the non-Irish Australian population are going to fight in the war effort. It's the Irish Australians who remain behind. And then he said, the Irish have captured the political machinery of the labour organisations and the church is secretly against recruiting. Its influence killed conscription. Its Archbishop Mannix is a Sinn Féiner. (laughs) And I'm trying to make up my mind whether I should prosecute him for statements hindering recruiting or deport him. This is quite, I mean, it's incredible language from our Prime Minister to the British Prime Minister. And he's frustrated because the Irish Australians are acting against something he's arguing for, which is conscription. But as you said, Jeff, the Irish had been enlisting pretty much in the same level as other Australians. So there wasn't really any evidence of it. It was more just the whole context of what was happening in Ireland and how that was impacting public opinion about Britain's actions in Ireland in the context of that great war. Yeah. You have to distinguish between the referendum in 1916 and the referendum in 1917. In 1916, Catholics are divided. It's some Catholic bishops coming out in support of conscription, some coming out against it. You have some Catholic newspapers in support, some Catholic newspapers against. And basically, Catholics vote according to their interests in the labour movement, for which they were a large part. But 1917 is quite different because between 1916, with the result of the referendum failing, Billy Hughes and many of his supporters start blaming the Irish Catholics. And this whole disloyalty factor comes in again, notwithstanding the fact that they are joining up in proportion to their numbers in the population. And so through 1917, this bickering gets worse and worse. And in 1917, the Catholic bishops say to Hughes, look, we want you to exempt seminarians and teaching brothers. And Billy Hughes says, yes, OK, we'll do that. But the Catholic bishops are a bit wary and they say, well, look, pass the regulation now and then that'll make us a bit happier about this. But Billy Hughes doesn't pass the regulation. So even Archbishop Kelly of Sydney, who was a very strong supporter of conscription in 1916, ultimately comes out and tells the Catholic people in the Sydney Archdiocese that this is a danger to our Catholic faith because Billy Hughes won't pass this regulation exempting seminarians and teaching brothers. So it becomes more a religious issue for Catholics than it had been in 1916. 1916, the apostolic delegate, the Pope's representative in Australia, had said this is an issue of a political nature, not a religious nature, that the church doesn't have a position on it. Come 1917, the church has a position on it because it is seen as a danger to the church. And so, again, Catholics are standing with their heads above the parapet on this issue and are blamed again for the loss in 1917 of the, of the referendum. At this time, there are quite major sectarian incidents 
happening in Australia, aren't there? Is this really the peak, do you think, of sectarianism in Australia? No, we've got more to come. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, it's not until about 1920 that the peak is reached. But things get worse. I mean, the country's very badly divided. I mean, there's strikes. There's a record number of strikes in 1917. The number of days lost to strikes in 1917 is more than before or ever after. In the middle of a war, we've got to strike. We had the general strike. It started in New South Wales and spreads to other parts of Australia in August of 1917. Australians are at each other's throats in many ways on the home front. They're fighting shoulder to shoulder in the trenches, but at home there's a lot of bickering, both at the sectarian level, at the industrial level. Australians become quite divided at this stage. War weariness setting in, grief amongst the population because so many Australians have died in battles that seem stupid. So war weariness has set in and Australians are becoming deeply divided. So it's after World War I, after yes. the completion of that, you really see the worst of the sectarianism in Australia. Is that kind of just people returning from the war? There's a lot of unhappiness in the population. And obviously yeah. Prime Ministers like Billy Hughes have been fermenting sectarian yeah. tensions through some of their statements and obviously communications yeah. with Britain. I mean, I think it's fair comment to say that Hughes used the sectarian issue to throw red meat to the base, as we say these days. It was used for electoral purposes, so he had a lot of responsibility for that. Mannix also, of course, he wasn't going to take a step backwards, and he and Billy Hughes often had the rhetorical fights. But with the end of the war, the sectarian issue doesn't go away, and the industrial situation also has great concerns. You've got the Communist Party being formed. You've got the revolution in Russia, so Bolshevism becomes an issue in Australia as the Labor Party is trying to work out where it stands on this issue. You've got the one big union. There are a group of syndicalists which are trying to take over the working class movement. So there's turmoil in the Labor movement and this sectarianism continues. But where it heats up is that, again, Ireland enters into the picture because in January 1919, so just after the war ends, Irish in Ireland embark upon the Irish War of Independence, and this is where they start to fight for their independence. The Easter Rising was put down in 1916, but come 1919, the Irish have another go, and this time they are more successful in that they have guerrilla warfare against the Crown forces in Ireland. Now, all of this is reported back here into Australia, and just as we've seen in other areas of conflict in other parts of the world, Australians can't remain immune from the divisions that form within our own community, we're observing from afar conflict in other places where people are invested emotionally in the outcomes of these conflicts. And so you've got the Irish in Australia seeing their compatriots in Ireland struggling for their independence. You've got the British Protestants in Australia seeing Crown forces being attacked and rebellion breaking out. So It becomes a divisive issue in Australia. So that's in 1919. Things get worse in Ireland. In March of 1920, the British government introduces the Black and Tans because it's losing the guerrilla warfare against the IRA, the Irish Republican Army. And so the Black and Tans recruited from veterans of the First World War and they used to reinforce the Royal Irish Constabulary. But they are an ill-disciplined force. They've got no interest in Ireland. They just want their 10 shillings a day, which they're being paid. And they ill-disciplined and they start atrocities against the civilians. So come 1920, things are so bad in Ireland, it reflects back in Australia on that. And then you get a series of incidents in 1920. In February of 1920, the New South Wales people elect a Labor government. And of the Labor caucus, 60% are Catholics. This is a group that's, you know, 20 to 25% of the population. 60% of the Labor caucus are Catholics. 40% of the Labour cabinet are Catholics. Now, if Protestants who were afraid of the Rome rule and domination by Catholics previously regarded as being irrational, I mean, Catholics are only 25% of the population. This looked like a complete takeover. <laughs> this looked like a complete takeover. And so you then get another series of things. You get Father Charles Jürger, who was a German-born priest. He'd left Germany at the age of four, went to Britain and then finally came to Australia. Billy Hughes had him deported in 1920. Back to Germany. 
back to Germany where he, he knew nothing. But is he during Sounds a bit familiar? The, We've got issues yeah, around supporting New Zealand as you haven't lived in New Zealand for their the entire things don't life. change. There's like, nothing no, new in, no, uh, no, no. in <laughs> our history. But Billy Hughes had had him interned in 1918 because of things he had been saying about conscription from the pulpit. In 1920, he decides he's going to deport him. A lot of Germans were deported in 1920. So the Catholic react to this. 150,000 Catholics of Irish descent assemble at Moore Park in Sydney to demonstrate against this. The trade unions say, we're not going to allow him to be deported on the ships. We're going to... But eventually the government gets around it and he's deported. You get then in August of 1920, Archbishop Mannix goes on a visit to Rome where he's got a report to the Pope, but he wants to stop off in Ireland. But the British government says, no, 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 you can't because you're just a rebel rouser and you're going to make things worse in Ireland. So he's arrested on the high seas by the Royal Navy and in turn sent to England. Again, Catholics here react in November of 1920. Hugh Mann, the Labour member for the seat of Kalgoorlie, is expelled from the federal parliament because of his criticism of British rule in Ireland. And when I say expelled, he's not sent out for the day like they tend to do. His seat is declared vacant. But in the middle of this is the Sister Liguri affair. Yes. Well, I thought you might be leading up to that. Of course, this is something you've been taking a particular interest in in the last little while, having written a book about the Sister Liguri affair. And we must make sure this is in our show notes so people can purchase a copy of the book. But I mean, this is a sort of a rollicking good tale, actually. <laughs> <laughs> As I say, it's stranger than I true like story, stranger Brown than fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you couldn't write it as a novel because nobody would think it was in. No, so tell us believable. about Sister Liguri. Okay, so I've given you the outline of 1920, this fabulous year. New South Wales Attorney General Eddie Tiernan uh, once declared 1920, he reported to Archbishop Kelly, he said, you know, it's been a hurricane of sectarian strife. And Sister Liguri figures prominently in it. Now, Sister Liguri is an Irish-born nun, born in 1890. She came to Australia in the early part of the 20th century as a nun, and she went to Wagga Wagga, and there she was served her novitiate and eventually became a nun in Wagga Wagga. She went teaching in a couple of the towns near Wagga Wagga, but then she got a bad report from her inspector who recommended she be relieved of teaching duties. So she was then given domestic duties. And this caused her great upset that she'd been demoted in this way. And she was not well, both physically and mentally, and rooted. Now, in July of 1920, Wagga Wagga is in southwestern New South Wales in the Riverina. And it's very cold in winter. And in July 1920, she decides to leave her convent. She does so fearing that her mother superior is about to murder her. Now, she then flees to the house of a Protestant family who are connected with the Orange Order, and she places herself under the protection of the Orange Order. It's almost seeking refugee status. Yeah. Yeah. And her bishop, who is very concerned for her welfare and thinks that she is mentally unhinged, has her arrested under the Lunacy Act. The Lunacy Court decides that she is sane and releases her and she goes and lives with her new Protestant friends and she turns around and with the assistance of the Orange Order sues the bishop in the Supreme Court of New South Wales for damages for having had her arrested. And she loses the case and uh, the Catholics celebrate. 10,000 Catholics turn up the Sydney Town Hall and have this great celebration. And uh, in the meantime, her brother had come from Hong Kong. Her brother, who was also Irish, was working in Hong Kong. He'd come to Australia to try to persuade her to go back to Ireland with him. But she kept saying, no, she wanted to stay with her Protestant friends. But her brother wouldn't accept that. He thought she was being gaslighted by them and that she uh, didn't know her own mind. So he decided to have her kidnapped. And he kidnapped her off the streets of Cogra, a suburb of Sydney and took her to a house away from her Protestant friends, tried to persuade her to go home to Ireland with him. But she said no, she wanted to stay. By a little bit of trickery, she persuaded him to allow her to go into town to do a bit of shopping. And when she was in town, she was spotted by one of the Orange Order people who informed the police. So two burly tech tapped her escort on the shoulder and said, OK, we want you to come to the police station. Now, You would think that police would prosecute people, but very cleverly what happened is Inspector Bannon summoned a conciliation conference 
where all the parties came together and he asked Sister Liguri, or her name is Bridget Partridge, who do you want us to go with, your brother or your Protestant friends? And she said, my Protestant friends. And that finally convinced Joseph, her brother, of what she wanted to do. So Joseph decided to go back to Ireland by himself, which he did. But this had become a great political issue because the Protestants in the Parliament were demanding a royal commission into convents. The Catholics in the Parliament were saying, keep your hands off our convents. Paddy Minahan, uh, MLA, said, if you keep on this way, there will be a bust up here worse than in Flanders. One of the Catholic MPs had to be restrained from trying to punch the lights out of uh, one of the Protestant MPs. So it was a very divisive political issue. When Joseph was allowed to leave Australia without charge, the opposition moved a censure motion against the government for having let him escape justice. So it's a mad era, this 1920. Sister Liguri is just one of the examples of this. Fortunately, it comes to an end after this. Things start to peter out after 1920-21, partly because in 1922, the Labor government is defeated in New South Wales and a very strong Protestant government is introduced, which then tries to pass legislation condemning Catholic marriage laws, which causes another furor. But it makes the Catholics realise that they are a minority and they have just got to accept things like state aid for Catholic schools. It's just not going to happen. Well, not yet. Not yet. Not, not yet. yet. Not yet. It'll take uh, Bob Menzies to, yeah, <laughs> to do something years. about that. Yeah. <laughs> but basically as a result of exhaustion in many ways, they've been at it for most of the 1900s at a very intense level in the war, in the sectarian incidents of 1920 and so forth. So gradually the Catholics start to back off on their issues. Ireland is resolved because we have the treaty in Ireland at the end of 1921, which is then accepted and the Irish Free State is formed in 1922. So far as the Irish in Australia are concerned, that settles the issue. doesn't settle it for the Irish who go have a civil war over it, but the Catholics Irish in Australia say, you've now got what we have in Australia, so that should make so you happy. less investment in that conflict then on a that's, sort of domestic level right. in Australia. And the Catholics back off on education. question of loyalty no longer exists because the war's over. So those three issues, which had been the, the thing that had kept the antagonism going, are removed. And you'd argue, would you, that the tone of the leadership in the States but also in Australia has quite an impact. So by the time we're getting to World War II, for example, I mean, you have a leader like Robert Menzies who is opposed to sectarianism, so he would have made a deliberate effort to eschew those types of sentiments, at least coming from him and his government. So you didn't see a resurgence in a World War II context of anything like that? Uh, certainly not. When you contrast World War II with World War I, I mean, it's completely different. I think the fact that the Irish question had been resolved, so far as the Australian Irish were concerned, is a big factor. And, and again, as I say, the education issue they back off on, so that people can start concentrating on being Australians and not identifying with these events and factors that had otherwise divided them. But bear in mind, sectarianism continued. And what you say about Robert Menzies and his personal views may be right, but don't forget the party system becomes very Of course, segregated. the Labor split, particularly in... in- uh, I was thinking more of the fact that there are basically there are very few Catholics in the UAP or the Liberal Party, not saying the fact that you've got a Catholic Prime Minister the first of the UAP, but that's because of how the split occurred in the 1930s. But Catholics identify with the Labour Party, and the Labour Party is seen as sort of the Catholic Party, and the Catholics see it as their party, and the non-Labour parties become basically Catholic-free zones. Do you get into the early 1950s and there's one or two Catholics in the non-Labour parties in the House of Representatives, for instance? The Cabinet, we talk about, you know, the token Catholic in the Cabinet of the non-Labour parties. Now, of course, that changes dramatically so that by the time of the 1990s and 2000s, Liberal Party, Coalition Party cabinets contained large numbers of Catholics. So the Catholics have moved on from being identified with the Labour Party. But between the wars, even in the Second World War, there is still this division of sectarianism as expressed in the political parties. But it is the great insight of Robert Menzies in seeing the way to secure the votes of the Catholics by introducing a small degree initially of state aid that in many ways starts to see the, the end of sectarianism. Some say it still exists, 
I think people of my generation grew up on the tail end of it. There were still problems with mixed marriages and those sorts of things. But generally speaking, that Catholic Protestant antagonism has basically dissipated. Well, Australia has become a much more, even again, more so pluralist society. And so the numbers identifying as Christian, let alone Catholic, is massive decline. And then you have you know, migration, of course, from Greece, Greek Orthodox, Italians, but they are Catholics, but I guess slightly different from the Irish Catholics. And then your waves of migration from Asia. And these days, the Indian migration, which is, is such a significant phenomenon. So the shades of grey between the ethnicities and religions becomes, you know, <laughs> yes. paler and paler, I assume. Yeah, I, I agree. And the term Irish Catholic is now anachronistic. One doesn't talk about Irish Catholics and British Protestants. But in that early part of the 20th century, religion was a strong marker of identification. And uh, we talk about culture wars and identity politics and so forth. It existed in the 1920s in spades, in the early part of the 20th century, in spades. But it was just a, a different sort of identification. I mean, people did identify as Catholics and as Protestants very strongly. These days, because Christians are in a minority now. They tend to come together as Christians, not as denominational Christians, just in opposition to secularists or atheists. Or yeah. Yes, and the identities people identify with, I guess, aren't necessarily religious ones. They might be to oh. with their, the colour of their skin or their racial ethnicity or their sexuality, their gender. All those things are part of what people focus on in terms of their identity. Jeff, an issue for today and debates over home rule and Irish independence, of course, are pertinent to this in some ways is, of course, how the Israel Gaza war is playing out in Australia itself. There is a sectarian difference between people of the Jewish faith and people of the Muslim faith and people who are sympathetic to either side. For many people who are very active on this issue in Australia, it might not be a personal, you might not have someone personally involved in Israel or personally involved in Gaza, but there's a sense that you are part of this because of your identity as a Jew or as a Muslim. And how does a pluralist society like Australia in, in a liberal democracy accommodate those differences when you have sympathies for a war in another land thousands and thousands of kilometres away like we experienced back in the early 20th century? Hmm. Are there lessons for us here from the sectarianism of the 1920s? Well, I suppose one of the lessons is is that eventually it'll go away. <laughs> but I think in many ways the Irish issue resolved more quickly than I think the Israel-Palestine issue might. But bear in mind, I mean, Ireland had been um, subject to British rule or English rule for 700 years. So <laughs> that was a long, slow burn before it eventually resolved. But I think just be careful because in Australia in the early 20th century, the numbers were different. I mean, the Irish Catholics, 20, 25% of the population, much bigger minority than, say, Muslims or Jews are. So much of the population was engaged in that, those identities then, whereas these days the, the two groups most directly affected are very small minorities of the population, and it's their supporters who aren't directly involved who are become divided too. But I think it's perhaps just a universal thing that people do become emotionally invested in these matters, and they're very important to them. And it's very hard, and I, and I suppose... Politicians have got to avoid the things that Billy Hughes did. Yeah. They've got to avoid antagonising these differences and making things worse. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for joining me to discuss this incredibly important part of Australia's history and perhaps a part that hasn't been given enough attention. I know in one of the articles you wrote, you were quoting, I think it was Thomas Hardy, forgive me if I've got the attribution wrong, but War Makes Good History peace poor reading and Australia's history has been because of a relatively peaceful history considered a bit boring but you've provided some moments that were certainly not peaceful and have made a very very good reading so thank you so much for bringing that into light for us Jeff. My pleasure. That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. 
please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook.